Andy, I want you. Uh, to, yes, hello. I want you to imagine you you're in stupid old studios and you're having another one of those uh, famously long conversations with Matt Stewart about yeah. AFL. You're like, we get it, 1966. It was the only year. How mm, do you mm. segue that into your topic? I say, uh, you know, uh, Matt, uh, you know, obviously that only recently uh, in Australia we've realised that women can play AFL. Uh, you know, another thing that we seemingly only recently have realised that women can do is uh, write and perform comedy for television. Um, uh, so uh, I'd like to talk to you about writing comedy for television. Brilliant. I love it. Okay, on with the show. the topic we don't know because he never does research for this show his name is jason he wants to talk to you about a topic you love or something you do no two topics ever the same that might sound impressive but they're all pretty lame a conversation with a conversation with a conversation with Hello, you're listening to A Conversation With. My name is Jason, and each week I'm joined by a guest, and we have a conversation on a topic of their choice. And joining me this week is Andy Matthews. He is one half of the Two in the Think Tank podcast, and uh, doing a lot of other things, but it's probably quite relevant to his topic, so we'll, we'll probably mention that down the line. But um, hello, Andy. Hello. Thank you so much for having me on the podcast. Thank you so yeah, much for from coming. Freezing on the Australia. Freezing Australia. That's what we call it in England. We're always going on about how cold Australia is. Uh, famously cold Australia. Yes, um, I am in one of the uh, one of the one of the more frozen bits right now. Yes, it's about because we 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 don't th think you guys know what cold is. We're always like ah, Australia. It's uh, isn't it on the sun? It's part of the sun. It's something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's an outer suburb. Um, no, well, the thing is, we you we 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 don't know what cold is, and so we experience it so much more intensely, I believe, than than you ever possibly could. Uh, um, so that is a great yeah. answer. Yeah. Anyway, it's got nothing to do with what we want to talk about today. Uh, that is, uh, thank God. Yeah, I think it could be a long a long podcast just about Australian weather. Um, well. Okay, so the weather in Australia. No, let's um, <laughs> let's let's try and focus. Uh, we're going to talk about writing comedy, um, specifically for for television, I suppose. Uh, so this is is this this is what you're doing. Let's say I want to say full time, but is that is that correct? Um, that's um, kind of your your well, main job. Can I say that? Uh, yeah, I'm saying it's my it's my uh, most reliable source of income. Yeah, which. I think is in in, in comedy in, in in Australian television that's about as as close to a career as you can get. You know, if you if it is your reliable source of income, then you've got a career in television. I feel like you know elsewhere in the world, like the states and you know definitely England, it feels like you know comedy and TV comedy is like it it can be a legitimate real career, um, and there are like pathways and structures and things that seem to you know work to, to to make that happen whereas in australia you know you you uh, th th there isn't there isn't any of that uh you will continue your life more or less as you do and then one day you'll notice that your main source of income is writing comedy and then a, a year and a half down the track uh that may no longer be the case but uh there's i i don't see a structure or continuity that that makes any of that predictable so I suppose my obvious question would be then, why did you get into this? So if it's if it's so kind of unreliable or or, or turbulent, you can't be that sure. I'm I'm guessing it must be a, kind of a passion project. It must just be something that you you love doing, and that's why you do it. Or is it just too late now? <laughs> <laughs> it, it feels a bit like it's both. I uh, I I came to it by a, a roundabout method. I. Uh, I studied engineering at university, and I was an engineer for a year and a month and a day. And after that, I quit 
and I wanted to go and I knew I, I was walking, walking to work every day um, sort of with this growing sort of feeling of despair and also urgency, a sort of a, a dispergency and this idea that I, I, I should be, I needed to, I should be doing comedy in some way. Um, uh, I blame you guys. I was raised watching uh, a lot of uh, Monty Python and um, and Peter Cook and Dudley Moore, which were both the things that my dad loved. And it was yeah, it was this feeling that I had had to do that sort of thing. And it was a growing feeling as I was, you know, going to my engineering job, which I I didn't enjoy and didn't feel I was particularly good at because I wasn't very focused on it. Uh, and but I I wanted to quit that and I wanted to go back to university and I wanted to do a uh, a review, a comment, you know, a university review. Uh, they're usually a law faculty review here in Australia, but anyone can do them from any faculty. And uh, in the end, I decided that I couldn't just, I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't just tell my parents I was quitting engineering. I had to have something else that I was going to do. So I said, well, I'm going, I'm going to become a teacher. Both my parents had been teachers, so that seemed reasonable, and so they were supportive of that. And I went back to university for a year, studied to be a teacher, and did the law review. And uh, and then I worked as a teacher for three years while I was doing starting to do stand up comedy and a bit more performance stuff on the side, and but I had exactly the same problem that I'd had while I was an engineer, which is that I I had as you know dispergency and I had <laughs> I had a feeling that you know I, I I wasn't a good teacher and I because I wasn't as focused on it as I should be because yeah. I had something else that I wanted to do. It's and eventually, after a year of leave, you were practicing your your stand up routines on your students. Is probably why you felt you weren't a a good teacher. <laughs> yeah, that 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 kind of I, I did I did that only once. I did that only once, and that was only after they'd found out by nefarious means that I was uh, doing uh, doing comedy. I, I I kept it a secret really effectively for a long time because my my authority in the classroom was already so fragile <laughs> that I couldn't afford to let, you know, the fact that I had this other pathetic career as a trying to make people laugh come out. Um, but yeah, and then eventually I took a year of leave without pay from uh, teaching, and then I took another year of leave without pay from teaching to try and focus on on writing comedy. At the end of my second year, uh, I got my first uh, TV writing. I got a phone call. Uh, pretty much the day before I needed to let the school know whether or not I was I was coming back and uh, and I I got uh, a call um, and I, I got my first first job and then I took another year of leave without pay and then I never went back. Well, I mean, a lot a lot of years of leave without pay, so we're yeah we're noticing yeah. a trend. Uh, trend. It's interesting and, that I think a lot of a lot of comedians come from a, a teaching background. Um, at least, like in the UK, I can I can think of a, a you know a handful immediately that I know. Before being a comedian, I was a teacher, and it comes up quite a lot on you know kind of panel shows and and, and things like that that they'll mention, they'll reference. Oh, back when I was a teacher, uh, I'm, I'm wondering yeah. if there is a reason for that, or if it's just one uh, of the careers you need to get out of. So, <laughs> it, it look here's here's my theory that i just came up while you while you were talking then uh, with while you were talking then so it's it's probably definitely correct but um it's possible that it it feels like teaching's one of those jobs that uh that parents will say oh you can always do teaching or teaching's a, a sort of a thing for people who who haven't really settled on a career a lot of the time or you know uh, or it's a good job that you might suggest to somebody who's sort of gregarious or or, or likes to talk or likes to be in front of a group of people, and you say, "Oh, you can go and do teaching." And so, teaching is almost a, a sort of a, a, a little offshoot of your sort of comedy. What, what you you might have some sort of internal, uh, thrust that is pushing you towards comedy, and 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 teaching is a little sort of side, uh, channel that you can go down that sort of uses some of the same skills and things, and but is ultimately a little diversion. You might be thrown back into the mainstream towards your comedy, uh you know destiny yeah. i'm quite liking this and I'm, I'm sitting there trying not to apply that all to myself and why i started teaching in the first place i'm so but sorry I, I resisted teaching for as long as i could um right because when i was living abroad it was sort of oh, oh you're english I, I imagine you teach english i was like no i don't actually i and i had a, yeah. a number of different jobs i did while i lived abroad and i was like no I, I i work in a hotel or i do this or i do that and uh, it got to the point where i just couldn't get a job and i was like oh okay Teaching it is, and um, and then I taught for a couple of years. So that was, 
and now I still do it. But um, but I'm wondering, is it because I I wanted to be a comedian and I just knew I couldn't make it? So look, no, I'm gonna I'm gonna say no. That's definitely not the case. Uh, remember that the theory was the thing that I just came up in thirty within thirty seconds, and it didn't even make sense as I was saying it. So uh, I wouldn't read too much into it. Okay, well, good. Extra ten. Ugh, extra. Not even gonna try it again. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> uh, and I teach English, so that's yeah, yeah, reassuring. Yeah, well, a... I mean, that maybe just the, saying the word existential there so badly could be enough to send you into another existential crisis about whether or not you should be even teaching if you can't say existential. Yeah, and now there's so no is, way this... I can edit it out. <laughs> yeah, because you just keep calling back to it, so it's in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, in. you're stuffed. I'm going to say it every thirty seconds for the rest of the podcast. All right, I'll just make a note of that. Um, so, uh, ooh. I, I've got another question then, which is a bit off the <laughs> off the probably logical path that we're going down. But um, you have a writing partner um, that, well, at least if I've understood correctly, because um, you're, you're the nature of our relationship. <laughs> yes, um, but I know that you've you obviously you've got the podcast, and then you put on um, some sketch shows as well, and you're always doing that with um, Alistair. Uh, yes. So if I'm not wrong, you actually also write uh, like for TV and stuff. You do that together as well. That's right. So, um, yeah, uh, my mate Alastair Tremblay Birchall and I are, are uh, it has a, it has emerged. It seems to the, it seems to have settled into a situation where we are comedy writing partners. You know, for a few years, you know, it was sort of touch and go. Could have gone either way. He could have found someone else. I could have found someone else. But now we've been working together so long that we're just seen as one unit and it's probably it's probably too late for us to find anybody else so we're stuck together yeah. and uh and we work together on a bunch of things yeah we've worked together on a number of tv shows um we uh have our own yeah our own podcast obviously our, we've worked on our own uh, sketch shows live and uh, and tv sketch shows um yeah and we're both performers and stand-up comedians and stuff as well independently but uh yeah, we sort of come back together and are stuck together and work together very I'm, well. I'm kind of wondering how that sort of came about with, you know, going back to your story that you were teaching, you, you left, you got this call, you started kind of writing. Uh, and I'm yeah, wondering so, at what point you brought in someone else or you started kind of collaborating with someone else. Or was it always like that, but it just, it came to a point where it was always the same person and maybe before you were kind of throwing ideas off of other people? Um, I don't know. Um, uh, Oh, I, I, I definitely have sort of worked with other people and that sort of thing. But Alistair, I, like, w has been there pretty much from the beginning. So after I, uh, when I went, when I went back to university and studied teaching and did the law review, after I'd done the law review, I was looking around for other things to do, and I signed up for a student radio mailing list. And at one point, an an email went around saying, "Hey, do you want to come and write sketches for this comedy show we're doing on the student radio?" Uh, it was an open call out for anybody who thought they might be able to write funny sketches. There was not going to be any money involved or anything like that. So um, you can imagine the lunatics who showed up. It was a room. We, we all came to this room and I looked around the room and uh, there was only per one person there who I could see who wasn't visibly insane. And that was Alistair. And, uh, and we've been together ever since. Um, he, uh, I don't remember, I, you know, he, we, we, we all went around the room and pitched, you know, what we thought were funny things. And I don't know what he thought of the thing that I pitched. I pitched some bizarre bush poem about a, a florist who murders uh, everyone in a village. And I can't remember what he pitched either, but I remember whatever he said. I was like, well, that is that is funny. And I want to be friends with this guy. And so I managed to make that happen. And he was already doing stand-up comedy. I hadn't started doing any stand-up. But then through knowing him, I got to know another, another guy who helped, who forced me to sign up for my first gig and yeah alice and i have been in each other's orbit for a long time and over time we um we started just bouncing ideas off of, off each other much much more and then i am um, uh and then and then uh some other people that i met through community television decided uh, and i decided that we wanted to start a production company and we didn't have any money so uh we couldn't get a studio but we uh, we could afford to hire a warehouse if as long as we lived in it as well. So we uh, hired a warehouse, lived in it, and made a studio out the back. And uh, Alistair was one of those people. So we started living together and making TV 
little stupid little community TV show and sketches together. And, uh, and you know, by that point, once you're living together in a, in a warehouse with walls, paper thin, you're, you're so intimately connected, you might as well just... Uh, just accept the inevitable. Be, and... Yeah, accept the inevitable and be together forever. Wow. Oh, yes. I'd, I'd love just to end it there, <laughs> the end of this beautiful story. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for listening. Um, but we'll continue. Uh, I just think it must be so important to have that other person because quite often you... So I... There's famously, oh, this is difficult to, to put into words what I'm thinking, but, you know, very often, and I think comedians probably find this a lot, that you've got uh, like a group of people, there'll be the funny friend and everyone Ooh. will be like telling him, oh, you know, you could be a comedian. Oh, yeah. you could. Or he thinks, oh, I could I could do that. And they probably can't. <laughs> Most of the time yeah. they, they can't. Um, and it's just that like it's quite easy to be funny reactively. Like so you see mm-hmm. something and you can make a little comment or, or you know something happens and you can be the one that's if you're if you're quick enough you can be the one that kind of I'm I'm very much thinking about myself if you're in a group of people that aren't particularly funny it's very easy to stand out as the funny one sure and when yeah chip in a little thing yeah yes. and when people are there and you say something and they laugh it's very you know you can then run with that you kind of get all right this is a group of people this is what they find funny it, it's quite easy mm. to to kind of be funny in that situation but the idea of writing something that will then maybe be recorded or done live or something but somewhere else down the line by somebody else to another mm. group of people and yeah. you're just looking at this line on a piece of paper going is that funny like i i've, I've written it down so i must think it's funny but but is that funny I... Yeah, I mean that is that is such a great point, and uh, yeah, and I guess you're right. Like that's why it is so important to have a, like a second, like or so valuable to have a second person in your partnership, right? Because comedy is like this amazing thing that doesn't exist until afterwards. Like you can, you, you know, if if you if you wanted to build build a house, you could you could build a house, and just by yourself, you could look at it and you could be like, oh, well, that's a house. I know that's a house, but comedy you can work away and work away at it and work away at it and then it's not until you do it on stage that you might step back and say oh wait that wasn't comedy at any point that wasn't comedy at all you you don't know until you've done it until and you know until afterwards you don't know for sure whether it was comedy but i guess by having two people in the group trying to work on it together at least you're almost like you're already an audience in a way it's not just you inside your own head so it's already an interaction because comedy is always it, it's an interaction between you and the audience. But if it's already an interaction between you and the other person in your team, then you're sort of you're on your way to like getting a successful a thing that that is you're, you're close to having something that actually is provably and demonstrably comedy um, before you've even got to the stage, which is like a huge advantage. And yeah, and, yeah, I, and, and I guess and, sometimes and then, like you're 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 you're, you're you're coming to it already with something in mind. So you're like, so you go, yes. well, yeah, it, it's because it's referencing this, isn't it? And if that's yeah. not obvious to the other person, that's when you realize, well, hold on a second. That, if that's not obvious to them, probably that's not obvious to me. And it's only because I watched this movie yesterday that that's even in my mind yeah. at the moment. So how can I put it across that will also give this kind of background information, but without being Absolutely. too heavily kind of, you know, I don't want to make them watch this film before I say this joke, but I want, <laughs> I want that some of the key ideas are there so that when I say it, no it's all coming back to mind kind of thing you're absolutely right like comedy is all about i, I think all I, mean, I find more and more comedy is all about information it's all about making sure that there's enough information in the audience's mind that the little extra piece of information that you give them which is the punchline or whatever it is that makes it a joke is surprising but you know but works in the context and if you like yeah yeah, yeah. You, you, you can't rely on people having all that information. Absolutely. What you talked about, about like, talk, you know, being the funny person in a group, if you're all talking together in a group, then everybody has all the same information because you're all part of the conversation. And I think that might be one of the things that like separates the people who are funny in the group and then the people who can go away then and work out what was the information that was important to make this joke work. How can I then take that out of that conversation or like come up with that information independently and then put that in front of an audience in such a way that they have all the information that they need to laugh in the same way that that group laughed when we're all talking together? Um, Yeah, and and it becomes much more of a like a a craft-like process, like a tradesman-like sifting through this thing, finding the important moving parts, the important 
um, you know, joists that make this structurally sound and then, uh, yeah, and then taking that structure and then removing it from the context and putting it somewhere else and still having it do what it's supposed to do. So it, it seems like there's maybe a, a number of challenges that I would say, um, you know, the average guy on the street does not kind of think about when they think, oh, it must be easy. Just write a joke. I'm pretty funny. I can do that. But the other thing that I feel, like if you're writing for yourself, that's one thing. But the idea of mm. writing for somebody else or I suppose if it's like a TV show or, or even a sketch where you've got to have different people involved, you've got to kind of think about how they'll deliver every line as well. Because yeah. especially comedians in general have very different styles. And, mm. you know, a, a joke or, or the delivery given by one person is just not going to work with somebody else because you need, you know, this guy's very, um, well, like we had Matt on last week. He's very kind of dry. Uh, yeah, that's fair to say. And, well, was, he, he named his show that. <clears throat> so I <laughs> yes. I don't feel that's unfair on my part. To... <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> but, um, and, you're, you know, you have somebody else who's quite uh, kind of wacky and quirky. And, like, you've obviously got to think, well, hold on, how can we who's going to deliver this how's that going to go I, I just feel there's probably so many moving parts behind the scenes that people just don't kind of take into account or i might yeah, be completely wrong I, I think that's the thing that i'm still learning like that's 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 the that's a big challenge and it it it, it makes every show different to work on you know because you're working with different people and you're trying to find the voice of the show and the voice of the individuals who make up the show and yeah, I would, I would not claim at all to be, to be an expert at that. Like, you know, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And you, I, I feel, you know, I'm getting, getting closer to being more flexible and to, to, to recognizing how those, you know, the interplay of the performer and the, 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 the piece that you're putting together. But, uh, yeah, you're right. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a big challenge. Um, if, if you're lucky, you've got, you've got a performer or you've got a, um, you've got a showrunner or somebody who's in charge of the show who is good at, recognizing what the comedy is in the piece that you're putting in front of them and then uh, massaging that into a way that's going to work well for uh, the performers. Um, uh, and, you know, as long as you can keep uh, observe, you know, keep communicating w with that person or keep, uh, keep a, like a, a, a critical eye or like self-awareness to your own work, and see what's working and what's not working on the show. You can sort of, you can you can evolve your work and, and get closer to that. So uh, another another kind of uh, question or line of thought or, or reasoning. I don't know what we're going to call it, but we'll work it out in the edit. Um, is <laughs> let's just keep saying nouns exactly until, until we, until we find one we like. I was just thinking. Yeah. So you're because you're a writer, but you're also a performer at the same time. So yes. I wonder how. I'm imagining there are a number of people that just write. They're like, well, look, I, you know, I don't want to be in front of the camera. I don't want to be on the stage. I'm, I'm happy to be behind the scenes writing, giving it to other people. Uh, and you're going to have other people that are, you know, much happier being out on stage performing. Mm. But considering you do both, is there ever kind of a, I don't want to say like a feeling of resentment. That's not what I mean. But it's like you're providing maybe some really good material for somebody else. And mm. I mean, and then people who know comedy and know how things work will look at that and be like, "Oh, there were some good jokes in there. That was some, that was that was fun. I liked that." And maybe even see, well, who you know, who were the writers? Who was involved in this? But most people, I'm tarring you all with the same brush. Sorry, most people. <laughs> but most people are going to watch it and go, "He's really funny," and not think, "Well, hold on." I mean, and obviously he had to deliver it in the right way, and there was, you know, I'm not taking anything sure. away from the performer. But is there ever a feeling of kind of you know, I'm just making other people look good, and um, it would be nice if I could be the guy out there looking good and and kind of progressing my career in that in that way, as opposed to perhaps somebody else getting the call because oh, we saw you on this show and you were really funny, and now we want to put you on this show. Um, um I, I I look, I know I know what you mean. I totally know what you mean, and I I can see how that could happen. But I'm early enough in my career that I'm just like it's it's so flattering and so. Uh, exciting that anyone thinks that even saying your words out loud is is a good thing for them to do. And you know, whenever an audience laughs at a joke of mine, who, regardless of who says it, it's such a it's such a great feeling that I just don't. I uh, yeah, no, it's it, it, it the, the 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 euphoria of, of 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 the the success of vicarious or otherwise is is so high that it overcomes any possible feeling of like oh I'm you know, I'm, 
uh, I wish that that was me saying that. I, I wish the opposite was the case, but unfortunately, when a joke goes badly, I uh, I I feel it so personally. Like I can't. <laughs> right. Uh, it, it, there's there's no barrier and there's no defense between those two. Like, maybe that is the opposite being the case. I don't know, but yeah. But the reality is that if somebody else says a joke of yours, I feel it really hard. I feel it probably harder than the success because not only did the joke not go well, but also now you've made another person have to say a terrible <laughs> joke. So they also feel bad and you feel bad for them and you feel bad for the audience. And it's just, a, oh, it's a terrible feeling. And that's the, that's the feeling you've got to, in a way that's, that's incredible. That's, that's a, that feeling is valuable because that's the thing that keeps you driving to try and not have that feeling again. Um, and I think in that sense, like comedy or successful comedy, I, I, I've got to tell myself, I've got to try and believe is it, least as much driven by the dread of failure as it is of the like enjoyment of success if not more so yeah and i suppose as, as you said it's i mean you you said you famously said about 20 minutes ago that <laughs> it's obviously not even really a thing until it's done you know until a joke is is told it's not really a joke yeah. kind of thing um i remember I, that famous saying yeah i mean I'm, i looked it up i found it on your your famous quotes on your imdb page now so <laughs> My point was that, you know, you're saying you're trying to avoid this feeling and it's mm. obviously so like, again, going back to your analogy of a house, like you can you can make a house and maybe before you hand over the keys, you go around and you check and you're like, well, let me just check that everything is exactly yeah. as, I, as I planned it to be or the different people I've yeah. had come in and do their parts. Have they all? Yep. Yep. It's all good. Uh, you know, final check. Right. Here you go. They're the keys. It, the mm. job is done. Whereas you're like, well, I really want to avoid this. And you can do as much as you possibly can, but until, and I suppose depending on, on what you're writing for, because if it's, you know, if it's live, it can depend on so many things. Um, just what's happened five minutes before, what happened, you know, yeah. w were there trouble, you know, oh, there was problems getting into the theatre because something had happened on the road. So everyone's in a bit of a, a bad mood because they've been queuing for too long. And, and it's like things are completely out of your control, but now will affect the product that you've presented kind of thing. Um, You're absolutely right. And like that is, that is the one sort of little bit of sliver of separation that you allow yourself from the joke and the emotional impact of, of, of a joke not going well. And that is, that is that you, you are aware that like sometimes audiences are flat. Sometimes someone in the audience, sometimes an audience lacks just that one person who's brave enough to be the first person to laugh out loud or you know, and and so it, everything takes more time to get to get going as a, as as a reaction, and so there's a there's a the energy in the room is just kept down because it never gets up any momentum. Um, so yeah, you, you you can be aware of that, and you can tell yourself that. Um, but but then you've got to be very careful that you don't just get into the keep telling yourself that the, bad bad room bad room keep telling yourself that exactly and and and, and blaming the audience because blaming the audience is one of the worst things you can do it's terrible when you see it like you may have seen stand up comedians do it on stage and it's just oh I feel I feel awful when I see it because I'm like no no this is your responsibility you're in charge of this joke you're in charge of the room and making these people have a good time and you can't make the audience feel bad especially the people who are trying to laugh whatever crap you're doing you know it's uh, yeah it's, it's it's the worst thing you can do is blame the audience so while you have the awareness that the audience isn't always perfect uh yeah you've got to you've got to not uh hold on to that too tightly yeah and i, I suppose that you know you, you'll identify that quite early on so you've got it is within your power to do something like if, if you if you realize it's not working the way it worked last week or in another venue don't just keep going exactly the same way maybe you know you've probably got the same material you can't change it too much but maybe yeah. just try something like what what is it that's not working try something try and adjust it instead of just going well that was you know i might as well just finish now i suppose yeah a lot <laughs> of the, the time traffic. it's something that's unacknowledged in the room audiences are very un uncomfortable when there's something unacknowledged if somebody's whispering in a corner and everyone in the audience can hear it and you as the performer on stage can hear it but nobody says anything about it everybody's got that in their mind that there's something going on that is unacknowledged in this room and i think there's like some primal thing that is like you know as as um neanderthals we would have been very uncomfortable if there was like a rustling in the bushes and nobody <laughs> Nobody said anything about it or grunted anything about it. And we still can't calm down if there's that unacknowledged thing in the room. 
So, you know, if you can acknowledge that thing, make a joke about that thing as a live performer, that's great. The problem is that on television, that's really very often not an option. You know, you, you, everything's so tight, everything's so planned that, um, you don't have that flexibility and that's where, uh, yeah, things can, things can fall flat and sort of go in a bad direction, unfortunately. Yeah, I, I mean, it's that's an interesting. I'm gonna I'm gonna look out for that next time. <laughs> next time I see something kind of not working, I'm just gonna be like, let me see if there's something going on in this room that I. Oh yeah, yeah. Look, look at that person over there. They're they're lighting the curtains on fire. That's probably gonna <laughs> weird that <laughs> nobody say something. Yeah. Um, I had a couple of questions. Well, one a bit, a bit of a question. Do you laugh at your own material when somebody else is is performing it? Um. Oh yes. Yes, I'm going to say yes for two reasons. Uh, one, it's incredibly uh, funny. It's in, it's genius, and uh, I'd be insane not to laugh at it. Um, and two, uh, I I wish I could say I don't do this, but sometimes if somebody else is doing a joke of mine on stage, I will laugh at it because I I, I want to make sure that at least one person starts the laugh in the room. Yeah. And then you know, and then if it doesn't go anywhere, that's fine. But if I start a laugh, this is what I tell myself: if I start a laugh, and then and then the rest of the audience all really laugh really, really hard. Then I, all I've done is I've just provided that little spark, but all the fuel was there and the fire is burning now and that's fantastic. You know, the curtains are, are aflame. A little oh. kick to get things moving. Sometimes you're the only person who laughs and then that's really pathetic. Um, but yes. Especially when you're I just do. watching it on TV at home with your family. Yeah, yeah. And your family's sitting around and they say, was that one of yours, was it? And you say, yes, mum. You know, you say, no, I just found it was probably the the best joke I've heard all evening to be honest. Um, yes. Didn't didn't you get it? Let I'm, me explain it to you because everybody comedy. knows that comedy is best when it's explained to you afterwards. That's the the key of comedy. That's the other thing. When I said it, comedy doesn't exist until it's performed, what I really meant was comedy doesn't exist until it's been performed and then somebody explains it to their mother. Exactly. I'm glad we're on the same page. Um do you have a a process when it comes to to writing? Um or is it just an episode uh, well, of Two in the Think Tank? Is that is that the reality? <laughs> I wish no. Uh, Two in the Think Tank is a show where we. Uh, you may, I may as well explain it. Alistair and I sit down uh, to do a podcast where we try and come up with five sketch ideas, and we just talk absolute garbage. And then occasionally someone will say, "Is that a sketch?" And occasionally it is. Um, but no, I like different shows have really different. You know, when you're writing for TV, if there's what, still what we're talking about. Um, different shows have very different processes and di- very different parameters as well. Some, you know, shows are trying to be funny, but also they're trying to convey important information. And then, you know, you're you're working for these two different masters, and you're you you go you're constantly going between them and trying to find a balance. Um, and others are really just pure comedy. You know, like most sketch shows, there's no rules there. It really is just try and put together something that doesn't go for more than four minutes that is going to make people laugh. Um, and uh, I've forgotten what I was talking about. Uh, do I have a process? Um, yeah, at the moment I'm working on a show that's a topical news show. And so, uh, we've got to find our own topics, find different things in the news and, and try and write bits, sketches, jokes about them. And, uh, uh, sometimes you'll get really lucky. You'll see a story and instantly you'll have a joke for it. And sometimes you'll see something and you'll be like, I think this does have a joke in it, but I just don't know what it is yet. I, and then, you know, you've got to sort of do grunt work of like, I, I put, for me, I feel like it's, it's, it's almost like a, a mechanical, a, a physical task of like taking this thing, this piece of information or this story or whatever it is from the world, this idea, and turning it around and looking at it from different angles until you see the one where the light shines through and it's like, oh, there's the comedy. That's, that's the thing that I was looking for that is funny about this. And, and then you've got to, you know, Turn that in. Then, then you've got to take that and turn that into a a a structured, meaningful, you know, piece of stuff where the the information is conveyed at the right times and the surprises come at the right points and there's a combination of character and point of view and that kind of thing that make a funny piece. Yeah. Are you aware of what other people are are writing at the same? Like, if you see, do you kind of see a you know a story in the news and you're like, guys, that's mine. I'm I'm running with that one, or is kind of everybody going? No, no, that's the one. We're all going to write something for that, and then we'll see whose is the best. 
Um, it's uh, no, look, you, you, you can't tell somebody not to write about something because, you know, if they write something that's funnier than you, then they win. But also, very often, you know, on this show in particular, the, the host of the show, Sean, uh, so it's a, sh- a show called Sean McCarlis Mad as Hell, and uh, it's a topical sketch interview comedy news show. Um, he will look at, um, you know, if he gets two pieces on the same topic, he might combine them. So he might take a couple of good jokes from one of them and a couple of good jokes from the other. And as long as they work together without undermining each other, you know, you'll wind up with a sketch that is hopefully funnier than it was going to be otherwise. Um, yeah, and that's just, uh, we're very lucky to have uh, him as the host of the show, is also the showrunner of the show and the main writer of the show pretty much um, with another guy. Uh, and they, yeah, they really have the sensibility absolutely down and make those things work, uh, which is incredible. Oh, that's quite interesting. That's a, yeah, I, I get that you can't sort of stop someone. I just wondered if it was, sort of, you know, everybody's writing the same thing and suddenly we realize, oh, we've only got one story to run with because <laughs> everybody liked that <laughs> well, one. Well, there is <laughs> there is also the thing of you could look at a story and there is there could be something that immediately jumps out at you as, oh, this is funny. This is the this is the joke. I found I found a, a quick, easy, great joke to do about this. The problem with that is there's Twitter and Everyone in the world is constantly trying to make jokes about everything that happens in the news. You know, there's millions of people churning through this day in, day out. So, so much of the time, those jokes that are the ones that jump out at you as being like, oh, here's the great joke, 10 or 20 people will have made them in the first hour after that has gone up online or wherever. And so you, part of the process as you go along is sort of almost learning to ignore those first thoughts. Or like, or to, or, or learning to find another angle on those first thoughts, so that it's not just the thing that no, people who aren't yeah. professional comedy writers are also saying, or comedy you... writers are saying, because there's so many other professional comedy writers out there, and there are daily shows, and we only do weekly shows pretty much in Australia. So there are people also making those jokes straight away, you know, to audiences of millions. So yeah, it is, it is a a, a process of trying to just take a deep breath. And then have another look and see if there's another joke or another thing that is a little more surprising um, to people, if you're lucky. Yeah. I'm talking like I know all the answers <laughs> and I and that I do this stuff all the time, but that is not the case. Well, I'm talking about the comedy writer. I wish I was. Well, we'll we'll, we'll take that. What I'll do is I'll just I'll delay posting the episode. <laughs> I'll give you a few more weeks to be that guy, and then Thanks. and then yeah. it will all. It all all fit Forward together play. nicely. Yeah. Um, when I'm the universally uh, acknowledged greatest comedy writer of all time yeah yeah then you can post the episode brilliant and i won't bad Um, so um look out for that everybody Uh, um so oh at this point i suppose i'm just looking at at how long we've been chatting um at this point usually i'd like to hand over to you do you have any questions for me on your topic that is how are we classifying your topic then just comedy writing or are we are we being specific for tv because we definitely haven't been up until now (laughs) No, we certainly haven't. I'm so sorry. I came up with a topic and I couldn't even stick to it. Um, uh, well, uh, here's my question to you. Uh, do you do you care about uh, writers? Um, I, do, I f- do, do you, are you aware of who's writing different shows? And uh, I feel like um, I, I'm more aware uh, in recent years than I, I feel like as I not even as I grew up, but you know quite for quite a while it would have been like i like this show it's funny i you know i like mm. that character he's funny or i like that that comedian and it wasn't until in the last couple of years that i was really paying attention to well hold on who's the showrunner on this why you know why is this episode feel so flat and then you're like oh because it was was written by somebody else and then maybe going through like the episode list and going oh hold on he also wrote this episode and i didn't like that one very much either and sort of understanding Okay. Okay. There are more moving parts to this than I was first aware of. Um, yeah, I, I think there's also I think there's a broader awareness, and I think it's um, sort of driven and uh, connected to sort of things that have happened in shows and in popular culture. And I feel like things like you know shows like Thirty Rock have done a lot for the visibility of of writers. You know, Tina Fey as as a, as a as a writer who who person who really started out as a writer or got, you know, success as a writer and then became a performer. Um, and then, you know, also contributed as a producer and writer to a bunch of different shows. Like her career, I think has raised awareness of like the role of writers and that 
effect that they can have on a show. You know, Ricky Gervais and that sort of thing, his success with The Office and then The Office going to the United States. Like people are now, I think there's a growing circle and a growing awareness of how ideas and shows and concepts and writers uh, interact with, you know, the finished product. Yeah, and probably just the the ability to like locate information just with with the internet with things like IMDb. Sure, that's with, actually yeah. a much better <laughs> better explanation. Yeah, sorry. Well, well I'll yeah. edit out your bit and I'll just leave this in. Thanks. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Uh, I have a very strict hardly editing policy. Um, oh, we have a very strict no editing policy, so you're doing better than us. Yeah. Uh, so, oh, so yeah, I think it's just that you can you can very quickly kind of find out who was involved in it. Whereas in the past, it was a case of you having to sort of sit through the credits. Or, or, yeah, or, and like hard. pick out names and be like, oh, that, that, I think that's the name I saw three weeks ago when I looked at the end of this show then, but I, I can't be sure yeah. I didn't write it down. I'll write it down this time, and then when they put the repeats on, I'll try and catch it again. And and now you can just sort of, you know, two clicks and you've got everything and you know everything that that person's ever written. And you're like, oh, actually, I quite like that as well. And oh, that makes sense. Why? And you at times you start to even kind of notice that certain people have, you know, have maybe a certain take on things that you do like. And, uh, yeah, and, and you're drawn to that, but yeah, I, 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 I do think it's. I'm much more aware of it than I was um, a few years do you, ago. Do you have any specific comedy writers whose names uh, come to mind that you're like, oh, I like this, the work of this person? Uh, well, I mean, there's obviously Andy Matthews, but he's, you know, he's, thank you. Uh, Correct, we can end the podcast now. <laughs> okay, good. Um, off the top of my head, no. I'll be honest, I'm, I've not been watching a lot of um comedy recently because. Uh, I was rewatching a couple of TV shows for some other people's podcasts, so I was <laughs> I was uh, very strict on what I was allowed to watch. But um, I will get back sure. to you. I will I will start paying more attention to when I finally get to. I am I'm trying to catch up on some um, some shows that I kind of used to watch years ago and then and then just sort of dropped off. And I'm like, oh, I did like that. And and you know, England, there's so much sort of satire and and, and comedy there is shows. So much. There can be show like we we get a lot of it here in Australia. You know our our, our um uh, public broadcast, the ABC, broadcasts so much British comedy, but it's barely scratching the surface. There are shows that are hugely successful in the UK that I I, I will hear someone mention as like oh this great big show, and I'll be like I've never even heard of that. You know there's there's only so much that we can access directly or even you know learn about over here, but the. I, I just I'm I, I I love the way the industry seems to be structured over there from afar, you know um you know the way that people are able to get in through um uh, radio you know there seems to be so many shows being developed trialed and you know built up building an audience on radio and then translating into television and writers getting experience on this and moving into that yeah. over here there's almost no comedy on radio at all. And uh, yeah, the very very little new comedy is commissioned for for, for television. So it's um, well, there we go. It's, we've I mean, we've solved the, the why so many Australian podcasts question that we had at the beginning because um, they don't put it on radio. So I I, I think you're uh, yeah I think you're absolutely right, and um, I think hopefully podcasts can if they aren't already um, can can become that sort of missing link uh, for creators to get actually you know either onto the radio or onto television over here. Yeah, there, there was a story I saw um, not too long ago when I was doing some research on, on podcasts and things, and it was very much that. It, it was from the UK, but it was somebody sort of saying, well, you know, this used to be the route to get onto onto radio. You had to do this and then this and then this. Well, what did we do? We made a podcast. It became very successful, and we got offered a show on the radio. And you're like, well, that makes sense, really. Uh, you're it does. You're basically doing a radio show by yourself, and it's successful. If you get a bit of help from a station... The, you know, mm. ideally it will be even more successful um, I mean, unless the studio yes. interfere and they ruin it and it's not your ideas anymore but <laughs> that's, that's something else isn't it has um, that ever happened never <coughs> never in the history of entertainment um, I'm sorry about the coughing again that's alright it segues perfectly into our next <laughs> next part of the show well, well done oh, um, so uh, the coughing section yeah, we've the coughing section it's, it's new but we'll see if it works uh, so um uh, once again, I, I put out a, a tweet just uh, asking for some questions without context, so nobody knew you were coming on. I wouldn't tell anyone you were until uh, until it's recorded, and then I'll tell them you have. Uh, no, I think even then, keep it quiet. Yeah, you know, the Australian internet connection is famously 
famously not that trustworthy. So um, yes. I want to make sure it's all recorded before I say anything. And egg on my face when I said, oh, you lied. You lied about getting Andy Matthews on. Oh. Everyone was so excited. We had a we had a public holiday just for it. Exactly. You kicked your family out the house just to have some peace and quiet for no reason. Um, I hope that really hope that didn't happen. Well, out of O room, so it's fine. Okay. Uh, right. So uh, I put out a, a tweet. I've had a few questions come in. I've, I've filtered them to to try and find some that will provide at least a degree of of content. Um, first one I want to ask. It's from uh, a regular. Uh, contributor to the show, Dante. Uh, if you could have dinner with any fictional character, who would it be? What would you talk about? And what would you order? Any fictional character. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'd probably have to go uh, probably Obelix or Obelix from... From um, Asterix. From Asterix. Okay. I don't know how that's pronounced. Yeah, I would have said um, Obelix. Just I because I'd love to see the way... We, we'd eat wild boar, and I'd just love to see the way that he's able to sort of eat it sort of almost spinning in front of him and then eat it like he's eating it off a rotisserie and wind up with nothing but bone at the end. So uh, I quite like that, that you've picked someone that will teach you, considering you're having a meal together, you've picked someone who will teach you a trick that you can do when when eating. So that's... Uh, look, ju- I, just, I just always remember being fascinated as a kid l- looking at that in the, in, the, in the panel in the comic book and being like, how does that work? Because, you know, I had a basic understanding of eating. And it just didn't seem to match up with anything that I'd ever eaten, but I'd I'd I'd, I'd love to see it in the flesh, as it were, and um and maybe maybe film it in super slow motion, then play it back like you like you would a magic trick, and try and spot uh, exactly how he does it. Start by practicing yeah. on uh, like corn on the cob, and then upgrading to to just sort of a, a roast pig, and then finally it is it, uh, it, is, it is eating pig like it's corn on the cob. You're you're exactly right. Well, I, I like the answer. We can move on Thanks. to. Uh... To our next question, Thanks, which is, if you could go to any point in time, when and why? <laughs> um, oh, sorry, I should say time. this is from Phil Better, um, who is who you oh, hello Phil, yeah, who you've heard on this podcast. So um, I certainly have. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Talking about podcasts, geez, if I could go to any point in time, I'd go back to when you were recording that live, and I'd just like to be there, just in the room, just seeing the magic happen. It was you and Phil. Did the podcast about podcasting? You know, what? I, um, I'm going to take that as your answer. That's the there, no, is, there no is no way. better answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, yeah, yep. No, that's my that's my final response. Yeah. No, I wouldn't go back. I wouldn't go back and uh, I don't know. Uh, witness uh, uh, Peter Cook performing live, you know, in a university sketch show. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't do any of that. I wouldn't. Uh, wouldn't go back to uh, to Monty Python, uh, you know, on the set of the. Holy Grail or anything like that. I don't know. I'd go, I'd go back to the podcast that you recorded about six weeks ago, and I would I would watch that. Brilliant. Yeah. Okay. Well, and and I mean, if you know, if you can't get here, if for some reason the time machine doesn't work in that way, you 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 just mentioned a couple of other options. So there's always a backup plan. So it's, it's always nice. No, to have. If I had a if I had a time machine, I'd go back in time to when they were going to reboot Doctor Who, and I'd say, look, just come up with a new show. This show's dumb. Wow. That's what I'd. I'd say, look, I've got a real time machine, okay? Yeah, give and me a camera, give me a GoPro, right and we'll make the show right now. <laughs> yes, we're going to do it, but as a documentary. And every time something interesting or dramatic could happen, uh, I'll say, no, it's not going to happen because that's unrealistic, and that's not how science works. You're misusing the concepts of science for your, for your science fiction show, and I don't like it. Wow. And they'd say, God, you seem like fun. And I'd say, yes, I am. I'm very fun. Now, get out. And they'll say, uh, and, and, and you say you write comedy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. Okay, well, um, we've got a couple of different options there. So that's yeah, that's brilliant. Phil, take the one you like the most. And uh, that's the answer. Um, the final question, this one will either go somewhere or nowhere. Um, I did reply to this, this amazing question uh, and just, you know, I had a few words for this person. Um, this is actually from Carlisle, who very kindly provided the music for this show. So thank you, Carlisle. Oh, but um, your question, on the other hand, well, let's see what Andy thinks of it. Frogs, yes or no? Um, I'm going to give you a hard yes on frogs. I, I, uh, I'm a big fan. Um, what do I like about frogs? Well, I like that they come from tadpoles, and I like 
I like that tadpoles have got absolutely no idea about frogs. You know, they don't know that they're frogs. They're just swimming around with their tails being, you know, thinking that's what they are, right? And then one day one of them gets a leg and all the other tadpoles must be losing their minds. I right? say, so look at that. What's that? Get away from me. And then they're all getting legs. It just must be, must be, must be just be such a fascinating time, you know, while they're transition. I mean, that's a real puberty, isn't it? <laughs> Growing, yeah. turning into a totally different animal. I mean, we talk about puberty like it's a big deal because we grow hair, right? Imagine being a, an adult frog and sitting down your teenage tadpole and saying, you're about to experience some changes, right? And then listing them, you know? The phys- the, the, your entire physiology is going to transform and you will go from being an aquatic creature into a l- aquatic swimming thing with one tail into being a, a leaping, four-legged, long-tunged carnivore. Yeah, anyway. I, I wonder when that conversation happens because I'm also wondering at what point the tadpole goes up to mum and dad and says, am I adopted? Because <laughs> <laughs> I've seen the family photos. I don't look like either of you. What, uh, what's anyone, going on? Any, yeah. Yeah. I, um, I saw the other day uh, an axolotl. Have you, have you seen them? That oh, I've seen them. And they, because they, they're basically the, the tadpole that doesn't finish changing. <laughs> they, they're constantly s- sort of stuck because they're a salamander that will never, mm. will never make the full transition and actually move on to land. They stay all their life, uh, yeah. in, in that first <laughs> do stage. Axolotls, now, but do axolotls start out as a little squirmy tadpole thing and then sort of go halfway to being a frog? To become an axolotl? No. I or th- do they just start as a little axolotl? I think they start as a little axolotl, as as most like salamanders would, uh, and so right. that, I mean, they just never, they just they just get bigger, but they never they never transition. Yeah. Fascinating, like a man child kind of a thing. There's you know, yeah. like 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 the millennials so for so often sort of caught in this in between <laughs> phase, you know, still playing computer games, still drinking with their mates, but you know, never settling down, buying a house doing those kinds of things that their parents' generation would have done. Well, I mean, with the, the price of houses these days. <laughs> I mean, an axolotl is lucky to get a, it's a it's webbed foot in the door of the property market. So, Carlisle, I take it all back. Great question. <laughs> it was, Great question. It was uh, by far the best one we've had yet. <laughs> um, well, right. Well, thank you again, uh, Andy, for coming on. It's been uh, a pleasure speaking to you. Uh, I feel like I've learnt a lot. Um Fun I've fact. certainly talked a lot, but I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say anybody's learned anything. Yeah. Well, okay. Well, we've learned about Except maybe frogs. about. <laughs> okay. Um, brilliant. So uh, I think we've mentioned it a, a couple of times that you've got your your podcast uh, Two in the Think Tank, and um, yes, and anything else that that we want to plug. This will be coming out uh, if you're listening to this in what is our future, uh, and Andy is now regarded as the most famous comedy writer of all time, uh, which happened on September 19th. So that's yeah, that's impressive. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Big day. Yeah. Big day for me. Um, <laughs> I have, <laughs> is there anything else I'd encourage you to listen to? Oh, look, you know, check out uh, other things on the, what, the, the network that my podcast is on, the Planet Broadcasting Network. Check out uh, Matt Stewart's Primates podcast, but you probably already had that plugged to you last week. Um, so I have, I have. Well, I have we can be specific. We can say check out your episode on Matt Stewart's Primates podcast. Right. Yeah, which is conveniently the first episode, and yes. I'll be doing another one soon. Well, there so was we a discussion about whether or not it is the first episode or the second. Episode. I know it is. It is teasers don't count as episodes. I'm sick of podcasts that number the teaser as an episode number. It's, it's well. garbage. Okay. Um, and on that note, plug, go back and listen to this podcast again. This oh, one that I'm on right now. Oh, thank you very much. Um, but so, download it again separately so that the stats count. Yeah, make sure you do that from somebody else's IP address as well. So uh, and um, and force somebody else to do it as well uh, if if you can. That'd be nice. So, uh, uh, well, thank you everyone for listening. Um, if you've enjoyed this, congratulations. Well done. Uh, uh, I don't think that's in any part because of me, but if it is somehow. Um, you can also head across to my other podcast, Getting to Know Who, that is a game show where um, a couple of episodes of that have now, have now dropped and uh, are being well received so far so until you get on there and leave a one star review. Um, but 
But until that happens, quickly run over and have a listen. Uh, the links will be in the show notes. Uh, you can follow me on uh, Twitter and Instagram at ACWPod. And um, you know what? Everything else, I'm just going to write it in the show notes again. I'm, I'm tired of, of repeating myself, say the same thing every week, look in the show notes. Um, that's everything. That's how I'm going to end it. A little bit angry and grumpy for some reason. I'm not sure. What, I'm not sure what's happened. I think I've rubbed off on you. I'm sorry. It's it's just it's just these plugs. I do it every time. I don't know. Is anyone still listening apart from you, Andy? I'm I'm having a great time. I'm definitely going to go and listen to that podcast. It really worked on me. Oh, good. Well done. Well, if I get one new listen, that's one more listen, isn't it? Um, well, thank you again, Andy, and uh, everybody who is still listening. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you all next week. Bye bye. And if you're still listening now, thank you for listening as well. And now, if you're thinking, if you're listening now, also thank you. Thank you even more. If you're still, if you're still listening now, thank you very much. Double. Now, um, thank you. Well, he's got a new guest. Time to put him to the test. Oh, yeah. What's the topic we don't know? Cause he never does research for this show. His name is Jason. He wants to talk to you about a topic you love or something you do. No two topics ever the same. That might sound impressive, but they're all pretty.